in this video we'll run a couple of tests to compare Rust and Go using real-world use cases rather than just running Fibonacci to generate some load. I'll be using a production-ready EKS cluster in AdBS to run this Rust and Go apps. In the previous benchmark, I used Rocket HTTP framework for Rust and Gin for Go. To be honest, results were predictable. Rust was more efficient. I used Fibonacci algorithm to generate load, but most people don't use these languages just to create generic algorithms. Instead, they rely on a lot of external libraries, which have different implementations depending on the language. So it's better to take a common use case with the most popular frameworks and libraries and run benchmarks based on that. In this test, I'll be comparing Rust using Actix framework, which is one of the most popular frameworks right now, against Go Fiber framework. Results actually surprised me. I specifically chose to use Kubernetes in AdBS as it's commonly used for running production workloads. For the nodes, I used a few M6A2 extra large instances. By the way, I have a full AdBS EKS course on my channel if you want to learn how to set up a production-ready EKS cluster. Now, for the first test, we'll compare CPU usage and memory usage of each pod. Most importantly, we'll measure client latency for each application and availability. Availability is calculated as the ratio of failed HTTP requests, those with status codes higher than 400, divided by the total number of requests, then multiplied it by 100. If availability drops, it means your client starts receiving responses with 400 and 500 HTTP status codes. In the real world, availability is rarely 100%, but it should be close to it. We'll also count how many virtual clients are sending requests and how many requests per second they generate. For the first test, we'll only compare the frameworks themselves in Kubernetes side by side, and we'll run the test until both apps start to fail. Now, the second test is a bit more interesting. We'll simulate a real use case that many people encounter. When the client sends a request to the application, we'll read a file from the local file system, upload it to S3 bucket, and then save some metadata about that file in a relational database, which is in our case Postgres. In this test, we'll measure CPU usage, memory usage, and client-side latency. But most importantly, I have instrumented each application with Prometheus metrics. This allows us to measure the duration of each function call, such as how long it takes to upload a file to S3 or how long it takes to write to the database. To be honest, results turn out to be quite unexpected, especially since I have tested Rust versus Go in the past. The source code is available in my public GitHub repo, and you can find a link in the video description. Before we start testing, let's quickly go over when you should use Prometheus summary versus histogram metrics to instrument your applications. The summary metric is not available in Rust Prometheus library, so I had to switch to using histogram. Now, you can use both metrics to calculate percentiles. If you use a summary, the percentile is calculated on the client side, essentially inside your application, and then exposed to Prometheus for scraping. For example, you can measure how long it takes to upload a file to S3 bucket. In my test, I used a single instance of the application, so I can scrape that metric and visualize it in Grafana easily. It's very straightforward. The problem arises when you have multiple replicas of your application. In that case, each replica would calculate its own percentile. If you have two replicas, it's still feasible to visualize them separately. However, if you have 10 or even hundreds of replicas, there is no way to aggregate those values meaningfully. You could get average value, but that defeats the purpose of using percentiles in the first place. So you should never combine those latencies together. 
If you have application that can scale horizontally, you should never use summary. Summary metrics are best suited for stateful applications, like databases, that you can only scale vertically. Now, in some cases, summary metric is not available to you. In such cases, you can use histogram instead. When you define a summary, you specify the percentiles you want upfront, like monitoring P90 or P99 percentile. However, with a histogram, this isn't possible. Instead, you need to define buckets. The biggest challenge with histograms is that you need to optimize those buckets to fit your application's behavior. For example, if you know that the request duration or a function call can typically range between 100 milliseconds and 500 milliseconds, you can define four buckets within that range. The more buckets you define, the more accurate your measurements will be. But on the other hand, more buckets mean your monitoring system needs to store more data. If you use self-hosted Prometheus, this just puts more load on that instance. However, if you use third-party monitoring system like SignalFX, Splunk or Datadog, it will cost you more. Now, let's say the first request took 50 milliseconds. Your application wouldn't record this request duration directly. Instead, it would increase the count for the appropriate bucket. In this case, your application would increase the 50 milliseconds bucket count. Since this request falls within multiple buckets, each relevant bucket count will also be incremented. For the next request, which takes 120 milliseconds, the count for the second bucket will go up, along with all the other buckets where 120 milliseconds fits. The following request takes 200 milliseconds. So it will also increase the second bucket count along with the others. The next request is 350 milliseconds. This will increase the count for the appropriate bucket that includes 350 milliseconds along with all the larger buckets. Then we have a request at 450 milliseconds. This will affect the relevant bucket plus all those that include 400 milliseconds and above. The next request takes 600 milliseconds, which will increase the counts for the corresponding bucket and all higher ones. After that, we have a request at 800 milliseconds. And finally, we have a request at 1100 milliseconds, which will increase the counts for the bucket that includes 1100 milliseconds and any others that are designed for the higher durations. In each case, the relevant bucket's counts increase because each duration fits within multiple ranges. So far, we have 8 observations, and in Prometheus, it would look something like this. Request durations are always measured in seconds in Prometheus. Even OpenTelemetry recently converted milliseconds to seconds to align with Prometheus, so your buckets would be defined in seconds. For example, dot 1 represents 100 milliseconds, dot 3 represents 300 milliseconds, and so on. To calculate percentiles, we do it on Prometheus or Grafana side rather than inside the client. We would apply histogram quantile function to get the percentiles. For instance, this would give us P90 percentile, and similarly, we can calculate P99 percentile. In real-world scenario, you would most likely apply some function to combine these buckets from all your application instances. We combine all the bucket counts, which is possible because these bucket observations are consistent across all your application replicas. This is why you can aggregate histograms across your application replicas, but you can't do this with summary metric. The summary provides final percentile values instead without any buckets to combine. In practice, we would also apply the rate function to track latency in real time. This way, we can monitor how latency changes over time. Alright, let's run the first test. 
I assigned two CPU and 256 megabyte of memory to each pod and deploy them on different Kubernetes nodes. First, let's run both applications side by side in idle state. You can see that CPU usage of both applications is very similar. However, when it comes to memory usage, Rust uses significantly less memory to run this web server, at least initially. Let me deploy tests job to Kubernetes as well. We have a client that will gradually increase the number of virtual clients, then drop it for 10 minutes and start increasing them again until applications fail. We'll start with 10 clients generating about 20 requests per second. When we start the test, for some reason, Rust's CPU usage increases compared to Go. This test only returns some hardcoded devices in a JSON payload. So both languages are just processing requests, serializing structs to JSON and returning them to the client. Now let's increase the number of clients to 50 and run it for another 5 minutes. Rust still uses more CPU and end user latency is also higher compared to Golang application. However, memory usage stays flat as expected. Let's increase it to 100 clients and run it for another 5 minutes. So far, latency ratio stays pretty much the same, but Rust's CPU usage starts to increase more compared to Go. Now, let's drop it to 10 clients and run it for another 10 minutes. This will help us to compare how these services adapt to spikes. So far, memory remains mostly unused and consistent from the beginning of the test. Other metrics reflect that we have less load on the applications, so nothing surprising at this point. Alright, it's time to push both applications to the breaking point. Let's jump to 400 clients, which would generate around 800 requests per second. You can notice that Rust is using twice as much CPU as Go so far. While this difference might not seem significant in percentage, the ratio remains consistent even as we increase the number of clients. Now we have 500 clients and end user latency starts to slightly increase. This indicates that our applications are beginning to degradate, but the change is still minimal at this point. With 600 clients and 1200 requests per second, the trend remains consistent across all metrics. However, Rust latency has now reached 1 millisecond. Let's increase the number of clients to 700 for another 5 minutes. We're getting closer to breaking point and you can notice that CPU difference start to converge. However, latency still remains higher with Rust application. Now we have 800 clients and 1600 requests per second. At this point, CPU usage starts to look similar for both applications. This is the maximum number of clients and requests per second that both applications can handle more or less within the norm. Let's go ahead and increase the number of clients to 900. You can immediately see that availability starts to drop because our applications can no longer process any more requests and start returning failing HTTP codes. The requests per second graph only measures successful responses, so you can see it starts to drop as well. Of course, this greatly affects end user latency, which at this point I think is not acceptable since it's over 400 milliseconds. We can conclude that both applications have failed at this point. This is actually a great example of why you don't always want to autoscale your application based solely on CPU and memory. Typically, we would set HPA to 60 or 70% CPU usage to increase the replica count. But you can see that these applications start to fail much earlier, so you need to use custom metrics to autoscale them. I have a video explaining how to use Prometheus and custom metrics in Kubernetes if you're interested. Now let me open each graph for the entire duration of the test. First we have CPU usage. 
you can see that by the end of the test, CPU usage is almost the same. Then we have memory usage. Rust only started to increase memory usage when it began to fail, while Go also had spikes in memory usage. Next, we have end user latency. More or less, both applications started to fail at the same time. However, I'm mostly interested in the latency before failure. Go and Fiber performed very well in this test compared to Rust. It's not that Rust is slower, it's just that the framework implementation is slower than Fiber. Latency is measured from the external client, so it's quite accurate. Then we have requests per second graph. And finally, availability. All right, these are the results of the first test where we compared just the frameworks. All right, let's go ahead and start the second test where we read a file uploaded to S3 and write metadata about that file to a Postgres. To implement all of this, I always use official documentation and examples provided by different SDKs. So my implementation would be the same as anyone who wants to start using a specific SDK, such as AWS SDK to upload files to S3 bucket. This will be a Rust example, and you can find another one for SDK v2 version for Golang. From the start, you can see Rust uses more CPU to process this request, and the end user latency is larger. This mostly comes from S3 latency function call. The biggest difference here is that Rust takes more CPU and significantly more time to read a file and upload it to S3, while database latency remains more or less the same between these languages. In both, I use connection pool to minimize the cost of establishing a new connection every time we want to write to that database. Let's increase it to 10 virtual clients, which would generate 20 requests per second. The file size that I read and upload to S3 is around 1 megabyte. I placed that file on each Kubernetes node and mapped that temporary directory to the pod. For the test, this setup is totally fine, but if you need persistence, you would use CSI driver or local provisioner if you need more performance. Let's increase it to 20 clients. As you can see, the end user latency for Golang is almost half that of Rust, and Rust uses significantly more CPU. Let's increase the clients to 25. At this point, applications start to degradate, so the S3 latency increases as well as overall latency. If we increase the clients to 30, both applications start to fail and latency jumps beyond 200 milliseconds. At this point, our applications would not be able to process any more requests. So for these applications, the bottleneck is the function that uploads file to S3. By instrumenting your application, you can quickly find bottlenecks and try to optimize them to efficiently utilize your resources. As you can see, the database requests are pretty much at the same level. Now, let me open each graph for the entire test duration. First, we have CPU usage for Rust and Golang. Then, we have memory usage. Next, we have database latency. The database was deployed on the EC2 instance in the same VPC, but on separate virtual machine. Then we have overall latency until the breaking point. The requests per second graph And finally, S3 latency graph. 
I have other benchmarks and tutorials on my channel. Also, if you think any application can be optimized to perform better, please open a pull request to my GitHub repo and I'll definitely test and merge your solution. Let me know what should I test next, new programming languages or open source projects. Maybe I should modify or add additional tests to the ones I've run. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.